Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this webinar entitled The Role of Free Trade Agreements in Promoting Sustainable Business and Human Rights. My name is Charlene Tan. I'm the Project Coordinator for the Business for Human Rights and Environment in Malaysia platform, and I will be your MC for today. This event is brought to you by BCSD Malaysia and our event partner, the Raul Vulnerable Institute, RWI. I wish to start by thanking all attendees for spending your afternoon here with us today. I also want to thank all of our distinguished speakers who have agreed to join us today. We will introduce them one by one in a few moments. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start today, let me give a brief introduction of who we are. BCSD Malaysia is a CEO-led non-profit organization formed by a group of forward-thinking companies committed to creating a sustainable future for business, society, and the environment. We are the global network partner in Malaysia of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, WBCSD. Together with our members, we want to drive systems transformation that is essential to transition to a world where 9 billion people can live comfortably within the planetary boundaries by the year 2050. At the same time, we strive to make more sustainable businesses more successful. Like WBCSD, we work with businesses mostly around six main program areas where systems transformation is needed. As you can see here, they are circular economy, cities and mobility, climate and energy, food and nature, social issues and human rights, and reporting and governance. In these areas, we initiate projects with concrete and measurable output. They all take a science-based approach and they aim for targeted business solutions to scale up business impact. WBCSD also has a number of active projects at the global level. There are hundreds of local projects from the 62 WBCSD global network partners around the world, like BCSD Malaysia and the BCSDs in the region that you can see here in this slide. The knowledge generated through our global or local projects is used to initiate or to replicate projects in some other parts of the world. This approach leverages on our successes and it minimizes wasting time and resources trying to reinvent the wheel. So ladies and gentlemen, trade agreements have long served as an incentive for trade and transactions between countries. In the context of human rights and the environment, trade agreements now have a much larger role to play beyond commercial interests, encouraging the parties involved to comply with a set of conditions in the interest of long-term cooperation. Recent years have seen a push towards the right direction of incorporating human rights and environmental concerns into the drafting of such treaties, but more effort needs to be made to ensure compliance on all levels of supply chain if you want to work towards a sustainable future. As new provisions on human rights, the environment, and sustainable development incorporated in FTAs globally begin to impact supply chain governance, businesses can no longer overlook the power of trade and investments agreements in the region. Now more than ever, the Malaysian business sector needs to step up their game. So for today, our esteemed speakers will be providing an overview on the free trade and investment agreements in the Asia region, their provisions on human rights and the environment, and will be highlighting key challenges in improving supply chain governance to comply with trade agreements. This will then be followed by a moderated panel discussion on the implications of FTAs on business and human rights. And before we move on, just allow me to share with you a couple of housekeeping items and then we can begin. The whole proceeding of this webinar is being recorded. Um, audiences, uh, the participants will be kept on mute during the webinar. However, if you have questions or any comments, please feel free to type it in during, um, during the webinar um, in the Q&A section or the chat box. Um, there will be a moderated panel discussion following the speaker presentations, where we will address these questions at the end of the panel, depending on our time constraints. And once again, this webinar is part of a series of learning sessions organized between BCSD Malaysia and the Raoul Wallenberg Institute for Human Rights and Humanitarian Law. Through this partnership, we want to be able to offer Malaysian businesses first-class training and support on tackling human rights and environment-related issues. Now, without further ado, 
Let us start the event with a welcome address by the founding chairman of BCSD Malaysia, Professor Tan Sri Dr. Zakri Abdul Hamid. Professor Tan Sri Dr. Zakri is the founding chairman of BCSD Malaysia. He's also ambassador and science advisor to the Campaign for Nature, former UN official, and a senior fellow of the Academy of Sciences Malaysia, as well as a member of the Prime Minister's Malaysian Climate Change Action Council. Until 2016, he served as the founding chair at the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services as the science advisor to Malaysia's Prime Minister and was one of 26 members of the UN Secretary General's Scientific Advisory Board. We give a warm welcome to Professor Tansri Dr. Zakri to deliver the welcome address to officiate this event. Over to you, Tansri. Thank you. Thank you, Charlene, for that generous introduction. Uh, let me at the outset uh, address uh, Mr. Roberto Benitello, the CEO of BCSD Malaysia, uh, our dear friend, uh, EU ambassador to Malaysia, His Excellency Michaelis Rokas, uh, distinguished uh, participants. Uh, welcome to our webinar this afternoon. I am very delighted and honored to be here to be part of this uh, interesting and timely webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, as uh, Charlene also mentioned in uh, opening remarks, uh, trade agreements have long served as an incentive to trade and transaction between countries through tariffs, quotas, and other agreed clauses they encourage the parties involved to comply with the set of conditions in the interest of long-term cooperation. In the context of human rights and the environment, trade agreements now have a much larger role to play beyond commercial interests. Incorporating sustainability clauses into trade agreements can incentivize cooperation or compliance with labor rights. This affects not just business or policymakers, but the millions of workers and consumers linked in one way or another to production and supply chain. Ladies and gentlemen, recent years have seen a push towards the right direction of incorporating human rights and environmental concerns into the drafting of such treaties. But more efforts needs to be made to ensure compliance on all levels of supply chain. If we want to work towards a sustainable future, with the COVID-19 pandemic highlighting severe red flags in the way businesses overlook non-compliance issues, increased attention is being put on countries and their cooperation with sustainability clauses in such treaties. In the EU, for example, there is increased commitment to human rights and democracy in new free trade agreements. In the US, human and labor rights provisions are uh, being included in the latest agreements as well. It is encouraging to see such commitment at the top level of policy making, and there is still room for improvement. More dialogue and cooperation on human rights is needed to ensure that fair treatment is given to all parties. Businesses, I believe, could do more could do with more awareness on the issue, the importance of complying with sustainable clauses and provisions, and take uh, concrete steps to reforming their supply chains for the sake of compliance. Supply chains uh, governance ought to be re-examined in the context of human rights and the environment to align local businesses with the same level of commitment and at the international level. I can say Malaysia is a bit behind on many of these issues. 
for instance, this past year alone has already seen a series of blows faced by Malaysian businesses, such as, the, such as by the manufacturing sector, as human rights violations and forced labor allegations surfaced rapidly during the COVID-19 pandemic. Lax regulations and non-compliance throughout supply chain have resulted in no buy orders or backlash from the international community. And uh, actions that we took in response to these allegations fall short of achieving long-term sustainability goals. Ladies and gentlemen, no longer can local businesses overlook the power of trade and investment agreements on the region. The new provisions on human rights, environment and sustainable development incorporated in FTAs globally will have impact on supply chain governance. And now, more than ever, the Malaysian business sector needs to step up the game in responsible supply chain governance. So at BCSD Malaysia, we are committed to creating a sustainable future for business, society, and the environment. As the global network partner in Malaysia of the World Business Council on for Sustainable Development or WBCSD, together with our increasing membership, we strive to make more sustainable business more successful. At the same time, as part of our goals for Vision 2050, we want to drive systems transformation, which is essential to transition to a world where 9.5 billion people can live well within the planetary boundaries by 2050. BCSD Malaysia, together with the Raoul Wallenberg Institute of Human Rights and Humanitarian Law, welcome you today to this session. The role of free trade agreements in promoting sustainable business and human rights. To our esteemed speakers and experts, we thank you for your meaningful contribution to the ongoing discourse on business and human rights. And to all our attendees, we thank you for being here with us today. Your engagement with the Business for Human Rights and the Environment platform is important and significant to us and to the society. I look forward to the speaker's session and the panel discussion. So to end, once again, welcome and thank you very much. Thank you, Charlene. Thank you very much yeah. to Professor uh, Dr. Tan Sri Zakri for the welcome address as well. Um, now we will invite our special guest for today, His Excellency Nicholas Rokas, the Ambassador and Head of the EU Delegation to Malaysia to deliver an opening keynote. Um, let me just share his bio as well. So His Excellency is the Head and Ambassador of the EU Delegation to Malaysia. He has 26 years of experience in foreign affairs, having joined the European Commission External Relations Directorate General in 1994. Even from 2016 to April 2017, he's worked briefly as advisor to the Director General on the Budget and Administration at the EEAS. Um, we are honoured to have him here today, so let us give him a warm welcome to the Ambassador to deliver the opening keynote for today. Ambassador, if you please. Thank you, Charlene. And uh, thank you to uh, Tanshri, uh, Dr. Jacri, and uh, Roberto, and the Business Council for Sustainable Development for inviting me to open this uh, important and very timely webinar. You know, uh, it is the third time this week that I would uh, speak about uh, the environment and social governance and responsible business conduct. 
uh, this Wednesday at the National Conference on the Business and Human Rights organized, uh, organized by UNEP with the support of the European Union. And yesterday uh, at the Cooler Earth Summit, uh, co-organized by WWF and, and Sim Bank. I think this proves that uh, the debate is ongoing here in Malaysia about uh, awareness, ethics, trade ethics, trade best practices, but also sustainable uh, supply chains and uh, how we can make a, a difference for what people now increasingly ask. They want the products, they want our trade to be based on sustainable uh, practices. So uh, again, uh, warm welcome to uh, the panelists and to the uh, audience that join us today. I would say a few words about trade and sustainable development and trade free, uh, free trade agreements that the European Union has negotiated or is negotiating. But I also would like to uh, refer to the actions and proposals that the European Union is undertaking on its own initiative to promote sustainability. This is what we call from our side, open strategic autonomy, which impacts, of course, all trade partners, including Malaysia, with which we do not have an FTA uh, yet. Maybe it is there to come. To set uh, the scene, I would say that uh, sustainability, it's a key element uh, of the European Union in negotiation of all free trade agreements. The EU's modern uh, FTAs aim to ensure that the benefits of trade to the economic growth go hand in hand with social cohesion and environmental protection. So why is that? Well, what is the thinking behind uh, the EU legislators' action? The European Union consumers want to reap the benefits of having access to global markets through FTAs. But also, this is normal, everybody wants to do that. But on the top, more and more, they want to know first, where the products they buy come from. But second, and I will underline that, under which conditions those products are produced. So EU consumers, to give you an example, do not want textiles made with forced labor. They do not want to buy furniture based on illegally harvested timber, or they don't want to have for the dinner table fish illegally caught. What we call uh, in the European Union trade and sustainable development chapters in our free trade agreements are already playing a vital role in this respect. The most modern uh, FTAs or the latest FTAs we negotiated they include binding commitments from our partners to ratify and effectively implement all fundamental ILO conventions and multinational environmental agreements, such as the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. But in addition to those commitments, uh, our partners are expected to give additional commitments on sustainable forestry management, biodiversity, and sustainable fishing, to name a few. And indeed, uh, these are unique features of uh, EU trade uh, agreements. And I'm pretty sure that the next speaker, Dr. Axel Marx, will tell you more about the achievements and challenges of what we call EU value-based trade uh, policy. And also maybe I can add to that, that uh, uh, all this is always a work in process because even our free trade agreements uh, that uh, we consider them to be very strong on sustainability, they can always be improved and are very positive in that regard. So uh, signing free trade agreements with the European Union is one thing, uh, implementing of course is another. So uh, that's why we are taking important steps to improve the enforcement of existing uh, agreements. Internally, we have established uh, a position of a chief trade enforcement officer in order to ensure that commitments are indeed fulfilled. There is not uh, empty words. And of course, we are seeing uh, results. Uh, let me name a few examples. Uh, for example, Vietnam has ratified conventions on collective bargaining 
which is ILO uh, convention uh, number 98, and on forced labor, which is number uh, 105. Uh, and, um, the, we have and they have issued, Vietnam has issued a, a new labor code uh, with our free trade agreement that we have with Korea, with the Republic of Korea. It, Korea has also ratified three of the four remaining core ILO conventions as recently as this year. So uh, it has been important uh, widely, this fact in the media, and that the discussions on effective implementation also of the Paris Agreement are at the heart of the ratification of, uh, for example, our uh, deal with uh, Mercosur. So I have told you what we do with uh, FTAs. The thing is what we do uh, with everyone else that we do not have FTAs. So currently the European Union has 46 free trade agreements in place. Uh, and on the top of, of that, uh, we have uh, a system that we call the generalized uh, scheme of preferences for low and uh, lower middle income countries uh, that could benefit from preferential access to the European Union market in terms of partial or full removal of custom duties and for least developed countries, uh, they can also uh, benefit, the, the benefits that go even further to complete duty-free, quota-free access for all products except arms and ammunition. It is what we call is an, another EU tool that we use and it's called everything but arms or EBA. Uh, let me give you some updates. Two days ago, the European Commission proposed a revision of the general scheme of preference to reinforce the schemes social, labor, environmental, and climate dimension. Let me give an example. Before, uh, or let's say beyond the core human rights and labor conventions that we already, we cover them, the proposal now incorporates environmental and good governance conditions and introduces the possibility to withdraw the benefits for serious and systemic violations of the principles of the international conventions. So uh, what do we do with countries uh, that we trade, of course, and we do not have a free trade agreement, but also they do not fall under those schemes, the GSP, the General Scheme of Preference, or the Everything Bar Arms Initiative, like Malaysia. So here is where what I referred earlier in my speech comes uh, our open strategic autonomy. So the European Union has set the uh, rules and, uh, and measures on responsible business conduct to establish uh, due diligence obligations on importance of various products such as timber, uh, minerals, diamonds and fish. These obligations apply to EU importers, regardless of the existence of a free trade agreement with the country of origin. Uh, maybe you have heard uh, the message from uh, the Commission President uh, last week at the presentation of the State of the Union at the European Parliament that, and it was a, a quite loud and clear uh, message, that there should be no place in the European Union for goods made with under uh, force labor. The European Commission, therefore, will propose legislation by the end of this year, targeting uh, mandatory due diligence of supply chains and especially targeting forced labor. So the sustainable corporate governance legislation, as we are going to call it, should introduce mandatory human rights, environmental due diligence for EU companies and their supply chains. In uh, July already this year, in order to bridge the gap between today and the adoption of the legislation, the European Commission issued what we call a voluntary guidance for companies on forced labor in order to raise awareness and to support companies in the implementation of already existing international standards of due diligence. On the environmental front, Maybe you have heard that uh, the European Union's Green Deal and the recently adopted uh, EU climate law with binding commitments to achieve net zero emission in the EU by 2050 
and reducing our emissions in 2030 to 55% compared to the levels in 1990. It is important that I mention that because it, it makes part of uh, sustainable business. So among uh, the various elements uh, of this package, uh, you might have heard uh, the fight against the uh, carbon leakage under our proposed carbon border adjustment mechanism and increase uh, uh, carbon sinks uh, by avoiding deforestation, including avoiding the import of products linked to deforestation. So um, all these things are very relevant, of course, to Malaysia, and it is uh, not only a stick approach, but there is also a carrot approach because we cooperate closely and fund international bodies such as the ILO, the OECD, the United Nations that work on sustainability. In Malaysia, uh, we have many initiatives. We, we support uh, the government, the Ministry of Justice in drafting the country's national action plan on the UN guiding principles of business and human rights through a project uh, implemented by the United Nations Development uh, Program. And we have also recently launched another project that will focus on the tripartite dialogue on sustainability supply chain in the Malaysian rubber sector together with the ILO. Uh, moreover, we are in contact with the business community and the industry associations, inviting them to ensure that decent working conditions for staff exactly to avoid that there are no legal bans from the EU, but certainly boycotts from uh, the consumers. So I, I hope uh, this short illustration of sustainability in the EU and trade agreements uh, uh, and the EU delegations uh, activities that I have honor also to head, uh, the, our activities on the ground set the scene for these events. Uh, as very rightly, Dr. Uh, uh, Tanshri, Dr. Zakri said, uh, Malaysia faces several uh, challenges, but we want to partner with Malaysia to address those challenges. And I think uh, our actions here, we can mobilize fans together with various associations, but also with uh, the European Chamber of Commerce uh, to, to, to uh, enhance the corporate um, social responsibility and make sure that uh, we eliminate gradually all uh, issues or notions of forced labor or unsustainable and unethical business practices in our supply chains. Therefore, I stop here and I want to congratulate again the Business Council for Sustainable Development for the organization of this series. And I wish you a very successful and fruitful discussion and deliberation. Thank you. A huge thank you to His Excellency for that informative and meaningful keynote. Um, thank you very much for sharing as well on the EU approach on all these modern FTAs. Um, this really makes a point, I think, on how adopting sustainable business practices will prove to be beneficial um, in the long run, you know, for greater cooperation as well for businesses and companies um, that are working as well as um, looking forward to working with the EU. We are truly, truly honoured to have you um, today with us to share this opening keynote. Um, now, let us move on um, to the next session um, where we will have um, our speakers to share on fostering responsible trade practices and sustainable supply chains. Um, let me just get my screen up again. Set up and working. There we go. Um, so the first session today with our speakers would be um, fostering responsible trade practices and sustainable supply chains. And our first speaker is Dr. Axel Marx. Deputy Director of the Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies. Um, Dr. Axel here today will be sharing with us the EU's value-based trade policy and human rights achievements and challenges. His research interests um, include inter alia voluntary sustainability standards, sustainable development, business and human rights, and EU trade policy. He has acted as a consultant to several national and international governmental organizations, including the European Parliament and the Euro uh, European Commission. He's also published widely on the EU trade policy in several academic journals and has co-edited a research handbook on business and human rights, which will appear next year. So now we'll invite Dr. Axel to share with us his perspectives. The floor is yours, Dr. Axel. Thank you very much, Charlene. Um, if you will, can you allow me to share my screen? Um, yes, uh, let me just do that. 
So thank you very much for inviting me to this very distinguished panel and also to speak on um, the EU's approach uh, towards um, promoting human rights through a trade policy. And I think my contribution will uh, build very nicely on the, the introduction by Ambassador Rocas, who already set the scene on how the EU is approaching uh, human rights and sustainable development in the free trade agreements, and why it's so important for uh, the EU to do so. In my uh, short introduction, I will try to provide you a little bit with a more in-depth overview of how the EU is approaching this. We already heard from Ambassador Rocas some of these elements. And then I want to build a little bit on this to also maybe introduce some of the current debates we are having in Europe on the current approach of the EU and also some of the ideas the Commission is actually proposing to strengthen uh, the current approach, especially with regard to the trade and sustainable development chapters in new trade agreements of which we just heard. Maybe just allow me briefly to set the scene and actually build a bit on uh, what we also uh, just heard from Ambassador Rockas. Uh, Commission President von der Leyen in her, in her State of the Union made a very strong plea on the importance of um, having values, human rights-based values, sustainable development values in all of its EU policies and also in EU uh, trade policy. And here you see on the slide a quote by the President of the European Council, Charles Michel, when he spoke to the General Assembly last year. And he also stressed that and more than ever, he said, the European Union is defending the rules-based international order and cooperation based on universal values. And a bit further in his speech, he really linked that idea to the importance of also integrating that into trade. And they tried to stress that the, let's say, the inclusion of human rights concerns, labor rights concerns, environmental concerns in trade policy will be ever more prominent. This is also reiterated in the uh, new EU trade policy of which we also already a bit heard uh, from the previous speaker and which was launched um, uh, and with the new commission, which also stresses very much uh, the importance of open, sustainable and assertive trade policy. And one of the core objectives there is shaping global rules for a more sustainable and fairer globalization. And the whole idea is that trade should contribute, as we heard, to generating economic benefits, economic growth, productivity, jobs, uh, and, and others. But also, we should try to take into account some of the negative externalities of trade and try to address those in its uh, trade policy. And the whole idea here is to really try to uh, foster better compliance with already existing international commitments which are related to sustainable development and more broadly to achieving the sustainable development goals. In the rest of my talk, I will briefly focus more on the issue of human rights uh, and labor rights and focus specifically how the EU is dealing with that in the context of its uh, free trade agreements. In its free trade agreements, and the EU has now already signed uh, several with a very, very uh, prominent, let's say, trading partner. So this constitutes a real uh, important uh, element of the landscape of trade uh, for the moment. The EU tries to integrate human rights and labor rights concerns in two parts of an agreement. First, and I will I spent most time on that, are the so-called trade and sustainable development chapters, the TSD chapters, uh, as we also just heard from Ambassador Rockers. But also important to note that the EU includes in every trade agreement in its first chapter of the trade agreement, which is called the essential elements chapter, an explicit reference to uh, human rights. And says in article one, of the uh, uh, general, uh, let's say uh, the chapter on, on essential elements, uh, that respect for democratic principles and fundamental human rights as laid down in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and for the principle of rule of law, that that's a crucial aspect uh, of every trade agreement and that that actually 
can um, lead to a uh, termination or a suspension of a trade agreement in case there are serious violations of, of human rights. So it's just important to note that uh, these elements of human rights are already included in the essential elements. The essential elements chapter and the provisions therein have not yet been triggered by the EU when there are issues, but symbolically it's very important to understand uh, that the EU uh, attaches a very, uh, uh, let's say, big importance to respect of uh, uh, human rights, democracy, and rule of law in the fundamental parts um, of the free trade agreements. Next, and most importantly, and we already heard about it, and which is also, I think, very innovative uh, from uh, an EU perspective, is that the EU integrates in its free trade agreements, so-called trade and sustainable development chapters. As many as you might know, trade uh, agreements mostly deal with rules on tariffs, competition, uh, non-tariff barriers to trade, all from the perspective of trying to liberalize trade and, and make uh, facilitate trade. But in that series of chapters, which really deal a bit more with the technical core of a, of a trading relation, there's also a very important chapter, which is called the Trade and Sustainable Development Chapter. And these Trade and Sustainable Development Chapters have been an integral part of the EU's FTAs since uh, 2011, so now for a, a decade. Before that, there were also already references in some yeah, EU trade agreements, but let's say the model we are talking about currently, and which is also used in uh, current negotiations, Builds on what was developed in, in 2011 and was extended from there onwards. Typically, the agreements provide commitments on human and labor rights and on environmental issues, and they try to establish mechanisms and institutions to really foster dialogue and cooperation on these issues to really pursue a further common agenda. Specifically, I think also for the EU free trade agreements is that they actually have quite an elaborate what we call institutional mechanisms built around the free trade agreements, which are mainly concerned with monitoring and enforcement. And with monitoring and enforcement, we uh, think about provisions and free trade agreements, which allow um, uh, the parties to see where the progress has been made with regard to certain commitments. And what can happen in case of non-compliance and uh, the procedures set out there. The current approach is very much based on an idea of avoiding a race to the bottom and also trying to uh, have a broader scope um, of issues to address. We already talked about labor and environment, all trade agreements starting to incorporate explicit mentioning to corporate social responsibility and responsible business conduct sometimes referring to the OECD guidelines in that respect. There are reference to voluntary uh, initiatives and the promotion of, let's say, uh, CSR through eco-labeling, uh, fair and ethical trade initiatives, all these type of instruments which are out there, uh, which try to make trade more sustainable. Specifically on labor and human rights, the focus is very much on the ILO core conventions and the ILO uh, fundamental principles and rights at work, in the, which were laid down in the 1998 uh, declaration, uh, which focus on freedom of association and collective bargaining, forced labor, child labor, discrimination. It also includes references to the promotion of the decent work agenda, which is very much uh, 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 pursued by the International Labor Organization. And just to know, it's very important that you always tries to, let's say, not invent or try to set new standards with regard to labor rights uh, or human rights, but really builds on what has been multilaterally and internationally agreed upon. And in that respect has some kind of a multilateral approach. In order to make sure that parties adhere to these commitments, as I said, the trade agreements develop a set of institutional mechanisms. Not going to go into detail here, we can come back to that in case you have questions, but the overall implementation is monitored by a subcommittee uh, on trade and sustainable development, which actually has uh, um, representatives from each part, and they receive impact from so-called on the one hand domestic advisory groups, and on the other hand civil society dialogue forums, basically 
external stakeholders which are engaged in monitoring the provisions uh, uh, in a free trade agreement. And in each of the partners in a, a trade agreement, these domestic advisory groups are set up and civil society dialogue forums uh, are conducted. And the whole idea is that there is some kind of, let's say, a continuous following up how the commitments in a trade and sustainable development chapter are integrated. That's what's there on paper. That's also what the EU is implementing now for a decade, as I said. And of course, uh, a lot of NGOs, a lot of academics, a lot of external uh, uh, observers are following this approach and are also trying to get to grips to what are the effects of the approach? Is it really making an effect? How is it implemented and, and, and so on? And through the last couple of years, quite a lot of reports and papers have been published which look into the current approach and which formulated um, a number of criticisms which you can find across papers, across uh, analysis. I'm not going to delve into each of them in depth, but um, there are a few maybe to highlight. One is that uh, there's quite a lot of debate on whether the EU should not um, use more what we call pre-ratification uh, uh, conditionality in the sense that the EU should try to foster more the ratification and implementation of international conventions prior to engaging in a free trade agreement and leave it less to uh, the uh, uh, implementation during a free trade agreement. Then we can, can return to that um, later on. We also heard just from the ambassador that in the case of, of Vietnam and also South Korea, actually the implementation and the ratification of uh, ILO conventions which are relevant has been taking up and is followed through. Uh, another criticism focuses on uh, the involvement of civil society and whether the domestic advisory groups are really working and contributing in their um, monitoring functions. Focus on uh, lack of enforcement, which is now partially addressed by the chief enforcement officer. But overall, there's quite a bit of focus on limited monitoring and limited, let's say, uh, uh, follow up of. Uh, recommendations on how to improve the implementation of the trade and sustainable development chapter. Now, this has led over the last couple of years to quite a bit of debate, and the Commission took that debate to heart and is really working on it and actually initiated an additional debate with a background idea on how to strengthen the current approach of the EU with regard to trade and sustainable development chapters. That was triggered in uh, July 2017 by a so called non paper by the G trade of the European Commission, which tries to set out uh, um, to understand what are some of the shortcomings of the current approach and how they can be addressed. And after many consultations, my, after many debates with business associations, with civil society actors, with academics, uh, other experts and so on, they developed a 15 point action plan, uh, which tries to strengthen the current approach uh, of the trade and sustainable development chapters. And in this 15 point action plan, they list very concrete actions which they want to integrate and already use in the new trade and sustainable development chapters in the free trade agreements they were negotiating and are still negotiating in, uh, 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 with, with partner countries. And uh, 15 points, we'll not go into each of them, but they are grouped by four big headings. One is to work more with member states, European parliaments, and international organizations to follow up and monitor the implementation. Very strong emphasis on strengthening and enabling civil society actors to play a role, especially with regard to um, uh, domestic advisory groups, and to really make sure that business, NGOs, other actors are participating, have the resources to participate, and can contribute to a meaningful monitoring of the implementation of the free trade agreement. So a big element, and there are actually the most um, uh, action points in, in CAPTCHA is really trying to deliver, trying to further implement. And that includes thinking about early ratification of core conventions. The idea of assertive enforcement really speaks to the idea of the established chief enforcement officer strengthening compliance uh, with regard to labor conventions, not only those 
in the 1998 Declaration of Fundamental Principles and Rights, but also maybe think of including additional ones like occupational health and safety and labor inspections. Further capacity building, far more, let's say, regular evaluation, monitoring, uh, and so on. And there, the idea is to really step by step try to single out priority areas where improvements can be made. And finally, uh, provisions on transparency and communication and to ensure uh, that um, what's been implementing and what's also been, let's say, evaluated is brought more open into the public debate. So I think that's a bit in a nutshell what the EU tries uh, to do with the trade and sustainable development chapters, what they try to do with protecting human rights in, um, in, in free trade agreements where they are now, and also a bit, I think, already with some of these elements you see here on the slide, what will be some of the points of attention uh, in the next uh, generation of free trade agreements. Thank you very much, and I'm looking very much forward uh, to the debate. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Axel, for the informative coverage um, on the EU approach, um, the strategies, and even the criticisms, which I think is important as well um, for businesses and also civil society, even policymakers to understand um, so what we can better do to improve and move forward as well. I'm looking forward to um, having more of your thoughts as well later on the panel discussion. Right, so next um, we will have, and let me just get my screen up again. Right. Um, we want to welcome Edmund Bond uh, from Edmund Bond Advocates to share with us his perspectives. Really glad that you are able to join us today, Edmund. Um, so let me give a brief introduction. Um, Edmund has been in legal practice for more than 23 years and is a co-founder of Edmund Bond Advocates. He's a specialist counsel who regularly appears in the Superior Courts in Malaysia to represent individuals and companies on a wide range of cases. Appointed by the Malaysian government in 2016, he was formerly the representative of Malaysia to the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights. Edmund was also previously a six-time elected member of the Malaysian Bar Council and taught business and human rights to master students at the University of Malaya. Today, we are glad to invite Edmund to speak on aligning priorities and approaches of Malaysian businesses with FTAs. Let's welcome Edmund to share his perspectives. Over to you, Edmund. Thank you, Charlene, and thank you, BCSD, for inviting me to share some of my thoughts. I have some slides, and can I just screen them up now? Let us know if you're able to share the slides here, yeah, Anne. Are you, are you able to have a are you, you should be able to just, yeah, if you click um, the share screen button below. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Are you able to see the slides? Um, not yet. Uh, maybe just give it a while to load. Perfect, we're able to see your slides now. Thank you, Edmund. Yeah, okay. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, a caveat first, my presentation should not be interpreted as a blanket approval for uh, free trade agreements in all their different forms. Uh, trade agreements, whether regional or global, do impact human rights adversely, and we need to approach them with caution. Every agreement must be scrutinized on a cross-by-cross -cross basis and critique as necessary. But trade liberalization brings positive and negative impacts on the environment. And I focus on environment in my uh, discussion today. The growth of economies and expansion will inevit inevitably lead uh, to an increase in pollution or degrade natural resources. At the same time, more incentives and opportunities are made available to support the capacity of companies to improve their management of environmental impacts. Trade and investment in environmental goods and services to improve environmental performance will also increase as parties seek to remove potential barriers imposed on them. Although outside this topic's scope, the controversial investor state dispute settlement ISDS clause in trade agreements is worth noting. Recently, TC Energy Corporation filed an ISDS claim for more than USD 15 billion 
against the United States government because the government cancelled the Keystone oil pipeline project due to environmental concerns. Uh, this uh, TCEC is alleging that the government violated the NAFTA and the ISDS mechanism continues to pose a chilling effect by acting to deter states from complying with human rights, especially when they are in conflict with business interests. Notwithstanding the, some weaknesses in FTAs, which we must not overlook, some benefits trade agreements bring to the table regarding environmental protection should be considered. Four points are made. One, increasing uptake of environmental concerns. We have seen an upward trend in environmental provisions in trade agreements. The OECD tracked the typology of these provisions and the travel from pre-2008 to 2016 saw a marked increase in the number of agreements that included the provisions. For example, clauses on substantive environmental issues were found in 45 regional trade agreements in 2016 from less than 10 before 2008. And you can see that uh, in the table uh, that I just showed. I'm just, I'm just showing now. Uh, why, why this has happened? Uh, it is to ensure that trade liberalization does not damage, but positively contributes to environmental protection. And to achieve that objective, policy coherence, coherence between environmental and trade objectives has to be enhanced to commitments in the trade agreements. My second point, driving legal and structural change. The Environmental Provisions Act in another way as a crucial driver for governments and companies to implement environmental policies, regulations, and institutional frameworks. Whether these structural enhancements translate to enhanced environmental protection domestically is still not conclusive though. Num numerous local factors are in play on why protection is still deficient despite a legal and regulatory architecture. The impacts are explained in this next slide, which I am sharing. Uh, Martinez Zazoso's empirical study in 2018 found that there is a statistically significant relationship between RTA membership with or without environmental provisions and improve environmental quality for two out of three of the pollutants investigated, namely sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxide. For SO2 and NOx, the magnitude of the effect is slightly larger for agreements with environmental provisions than for those without. But further research is still necessary to substantiate or falsify the link. Be that as it may, Trade agreements with environmental provisions provide an opportunity for governments to update their laws, practices, and policies to meet global standards, if there is the political will to do so. Malaysia is due to ratify the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, CPTPP, that strives to promote sustainable development, CSR, and environmental protection and conservation. Chapter 20 on the environment commits state parties to pursue high levels of environmental protection, enforce env environmental laws effectively, and promote transparency, accountability, and public participation through consultations regarding environmental matters. While it is arguable that Malaysia meets the basic standards expected, legal and implementation gaps are still in evidence. The Malaysian government's effort to adopt a national action plan on business and human rights on labor, governance, and environment will hopefully yield results that will heighten the protection of, an, of our environmental rights. Unfortunately, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP, RCEP, which Malaysia signed and is expected to ratify by the end of 2021, or at least at the latest in the first quarter of 2022, does not expressly emphasize nor advance environmental cooperation and protection. It has no provisions on labor standards or transitions to greener industries. It has been described as a squandered opportunity for trade to advance human rights and environmental protection. My third point, at a more micro level, how do trade agreements impact businesses? Much will depend on how the Malaysian government implements its obligations under the agreements. I use three clauses from the CPTPP to explain the point. Two provisions are mandatory while one is voluntary. Articles 20.8 and 20.9 are interesting. They provide for broader participation and scrutiny by the Malaysian public regarding the government's implementation of Chapter 20. 
the government is obliged to establish a mechanism to respond to requests for information and written submissions filed by the public. If a submission asserts that the government is failing to enforce its environmental laws effectively, other countries may request that the Committee on the Environment discuss the submission. Next, under Article 20.5, the government must take measures to control the production and consumption of substances that can deplete or modify the ozone layer in a manner that results in adverse effects on the environment. Third, Article 20.15 states that transition to low emissions economy depends on domestic circumstances and capabilities. This provision is couched in voluntary terms. Uh, parties are to cooperate and there's no binding quantitative uh, quantifiable indicators for the government to meet. My point is arguably the public protection mechanism in Articles 20.8 and 20.9 changes the environmental rights advocacy landscape. Most significant public pressure through the submission process will ensure better accountability from the government in curbing business operations that are detrimental to the environment. In turn, businesses will be compelled to stop harmful practices. Regarding Article 20.5, uh, 20 Malaysia in October 2020 ratified the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Pro Protocol on Substances that Deplete the Ozone Layer to Phase Down HFCs by Cutting Their Production and Consumption. Regulatory measures to be introduced remains to be seen, but achieving the Kigali target will also satisfy Article 20.5. In terms of non-binding Article 20.15, the question is how far the Malaysian government will engage and work with other governments to accelerate the country's transition to a low emissions economy. Malaysia should embrace the opportunity to build its capacity of its line agencies, civil society organization, and businesses to collectively move ahead on this. But because there are no fixed indicators set under 20.15, it will not be easy to assess the provision's impact on companies. However, I, I, I would say that it does not relieve businesses from working towards the transition by having their own environmental goals. In short, the environmental provisions will impact business operations if the government tightens its regulations and imposes more stringent measures that companies must take to manage their environmental risks. My final point, what are some of the steps Malaysian companies can adopt to stay ahead of the curve and align their practices with environmental protection? Internally, there's a need to take a longer view of climate risks. Business priorities have to be re-ramped, not only to comply with legal obligations, but to uncover environmental impacts to be mitigated and recognize that environmental rights are also human rights. Further, the precautionary, precautionary approach, sorry, first mooted in 1992, in the Rio Declaration on Environment and Development should be embedded in every stage of the organization's operations. Action to prevent or avert serious harm to the environment should be taken now and immediately because delaying action until there is compelling evidence of harm will prove costly, both to avert the harm and repair the business damage reputation. In summary, three key steps are suggested. Evaluate your business environmental risks and opportunities. Common concerns including pollution, include pollution, emissions, waste management, and the use of natural resources such as water, raw materials, and energy. A human rights due diligence exercise should be conducted to assess the impact of your operations to take action to prevent or mitigate them. Your value chain should be mapped and assessed as well. Where possible, scenario modeling should be done to examine the what if. The modeling will further clarify the risks and opportunities. Two, develop, adopt, and implement your environmental strategy consistent with human rights standards. Post assessment, set specific and measurable targets as part of your business objectives and environmental strategy. It may include embracing decarbonization as a business opportunity and incorporating carbon removal into your supply chains. Genuine and effective consultative processes must also form a core component of all human rights-based strategies, be it with employees or sensitive receptors, such as nearby residents or indigenous groups whose lives are impacted by business activities. And finally, monitor, evaluate, and report your gains and losses transparently. Investors and consumers are keen to understand how you review and evaluate the organization's human rights compliance and performance. Often used methods include sustainability self-reporting by companies or disclosures to corporate human rights indexes that rate and benchmark companies' performances.
The goal must be to regularly, com regularly communicate the results of these measures supported by truthful and relevant information for public consumption. Thank you very much uh, for your time. And I hand it back to you, Shali. All right, many thanks to Edmund for providing us with all those insights as well. Um, I think it was really useful to hear, especially from um, the Malaysian legal perspective, um, especially on some of the steps that Malaysian businesses can take um, to align their priorities with all of these kind of policies. I'm looking forward to having all your um, further thoughts as well during the panel discussion later. Right. So now um, I'm just going to get my slides up again and we will invite um, our last speaker for today, uh, Miss Cynthia Ann Peterson from Petronas, um, to share with us on assessments and capacity building, taking a balanced approach for a sustainable supply chain. Now, Cynthia is a principal of social performance in Petronas at the group level. She has been in the energy industry for over a decade with international experience in managing social risks across the life cycle of the upstream and the downstream business. She also has experience in developing sustainability strategy and sustainability reporting. Um, we welcome Cynthia today to share on assessments and capacity building, taking a balanced approach for a sustainable supply chain. Cynthia, if you please. Thank you, Charlene. Um, yeah, so um, thank you very much for, um, you know, giving us the opportunity to talk about this issue from um, the implementer or the user perspective, um, which is um, the business. Um, I'd just like to make three um, really, uh, I, I would say, uh, broad points about um, uh, the impact of um, human rights and um, the issue of human rights due diligence in the supply chain. Um, the first thing I'd like to say is that um, human rights due diligence in the supply chain is something that has grown over the years in terms of its aware of awareness. And um, you know, the various industries, especially um, the energy sector has really taken this on board uh, to try to cascade um, the uh, risk uh, management approach that we tend to have um, to our um, value chain. Um, what we've been seeing is that, um, you know, as it has been um, um, elucidated by uh, previous speakers, that uh, there's a growing, um, uh, growing uh, body of legislation and soft laws require uh, soft law requirements uh, regarding, especially um, forced labor. Uh, we we have um, noted, uh, you know, there are some um, mandatory human rights due diligence requirements um, in in some. Uh, in some jurisdictions, and so you know the you know as the issue kind of cascades uh, to uh, players say in Malaysia, it's really important for for um, people for uh, companies in the supply chain to really understand that um, it's not some it these exposures are there and it's not something that um, happens to uh, you know in in Europe for example, we're all part of a, a larger value uh, value chain, so. From the perspective of companies, um, it's really important to um, uh, push through this idea and create that awareness because um, companies do have a risk-based approach, especially from the energy sector. Um, human rights due diligence is something that has been happening for, um, for quite a while now. And um, to translate that into the um, supply chain was a logical next step. Um, as you're probably aware, um, supply chains tend to be quite complex and, you know, the further down the chain goes, um, the more and more opaque um, the view becomes. So there are some real world challenges uh, regarding, um, you know, and ensuring that uh, respect for human rights is something that um, a company can um, definitely push through its value chain. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, it's a challenge that um, the industry such as uh, for the energy sector um, is really looking at. Uh, the, the main point I really wanted to focus on, um, you know, is really uh, what it takes to enable um, human rights due diligence to really happen and um, to eliminate forced labor from the value chain. Uh, this comes down to collaboration with um, contractors and suppliers and partners and any, any other collaborator that, uh, that a company works with. Um, from our experience, what we found was that um, it was really important to um, first and foremost create a platform 
where uh, contractors and and the like, you know, can have an open discussion with companies who are in fact their clients. It's really important for um, everybody within the value chain to understand that, um, you know, taking a work together approach uh, can sometimes be more effective than, um, you know, taking a more punitive approach. So uh, what we found was that um, several measures do work um, in concert. So there's no one particular thing that, uh, that can solve, resolve this issue. So what, so uh, for example, what we have been doing is um, from a contractual level, uh, we have included uh, respect for human rights as a contractual obligation. Um, and this will then, you know, uh, sort of daisy chain um, as, as the contractors go. Um, we have a contractor code of conduct on human rights, um, which is also um, something which um, sets out the expectations so that when we talk about human rights, it's not really a surprise uh, uh, with contractors. And um, it's, you know, one of the key challenges really is um, uh, in terms of uh, understanding what, um, you know, what is the state of human rights in the value chain. So uh, one of the things that we have been doing quite successfully since 2017 is um, a contractor self-assessment and um, sampling um, assessments uh, by Petronas uh, just to understand uh, the responses that we receive and also to um, get a chance to discuss, you know, what are the challenges that contractors tend to face uh, regarding human rights and uh, also what are some of the good practices that uh, they, they do in fact have, because you know, sometimes um, even very small companies can have some um, innovative localized practices that uh, could actually be scaled up. Through our self-assessments, um, a couple of things uh, tend to surface to the top. Uh, really, um, the understanding of human rights requirements is quite um, patchy. There's an overall understanding that is important, but um, how it relates to businesses in the value chain can sometimes um, require a bit of work. Very small companies, for example, um, especially if they have uh, fewer than um, 10 staff, they tend to feel that this is not really an issue for them um, because you know, uh, human rights is something that uh, big companies uh, need to be concerned about. The other thing is, of course, formalization of processes, you know, for example, um, grievance mechanisms, they tend to be very uh, informal and um, there's, no, uh, there's no record of uh, what the grievances were. There's no learning from the grievances either. So th those are some of the things which um, tend to surface to the top. The other thing uh, which we did focus on um, was the aspect of training. And, and this is uh, one of the key things that we found uh, has worked to try to influence the supply chain in terms of understanding why, why human rights due diligence is important um, and understand why the labor issues are something which uh, we're concerned about. So um, in Malaysia, for example, there are, if, if I'm not mistaken, there are 28 um, labor laws and uh, there are some under revision. Um, and those, those are actually, I think, good signs that um, the laws are currently being updated to ensure that uh, protection of, uh, of labor um, is there. Uh, but when we talk to contractors, you know, they, it, it's, quite, it, it's, it's quite interesting that, you know, the mindset of um, cost, time and um, scope is really top of mind for most contractors. Um, the hum bringing human rights into the conversation um, was a little bit strange initially, but you know, over time, uh, they do find that actually they have been, um, you know, uh, working on human rights issues. It's just that they, they don't formally call it that. So training really does work. Uh, we, we have a lot of engagements um, and we also try to facilitate engagements between um, authorities and contractors. So, for example, uh, we did have um, a workshop very recently on uh, the revised uh, Act 446 on the minimum standards of worker accommodations and amenities. Um, this was really uh, quite an eye opener because um, various things which were in the guideline previously are now um, uh, uh, enforced in law, uh, but many contractors uh, were either um, not really aware that it applied to them or um, they, they, they just weren't, weren't sure um, how, you know, what the expectations were. So, you know, working to, with contractors to upskill them was really um, an effort that we have put in. Um, and we have seen some improvements um, over the last uh, three to four years. Uh, some contract, uh, a couple of contractors do come back to, 
and demonstrate that they've improved their internal controls, their internal processes, um, the uh, recognition that um, assessment of their subcontractors is also uh, something that they need to do. So this is really a, a work in progress. Uh, the third point I'd really like to make is that um, COVID-19 has really um, highlighted some of the um, gaps that um, need to be worked on. Um, for, for, for a very strange, rather strangely, uh, we do find that somehow or other human rights has been pitted against um, company survival. This is a, a kind of a strange phenomena, but um, from a contractor perspective, um, it's quite understandable, you know, because um, some, some practices have been normalized, even though um, they, they go against um, company requirements, for example. So um, to, and to, to shift the conversation from you know, human rights versus company survival to human rights is part of your company survival um, is, is one thing that, um, that needs to, to happen and uh, you know, a conversation that we've been having with contractors um, you know, since, since last year. A couple of other things that we've done is also you know, to put out um, guidance um, from a human rights lens uh, on uh, what to do or what we expect um, uh, in terms of uh, fulfilling our contractor code of conduct and, uh, on human rights uh, from a COVID-19 uh, perspective, and um, also, you know, to be um, to to reinforce the requirement of the grievance mechanism, because um, human rights due diligence is uh, is of course one process, but the success of protecting and respecting rights is actually uh, requires a more holistic approach. So um, grievance mechanism has actually proven to be, you know, one of the key mechanisms to identify um, areas for improvement as well as um, good practices. Uh, in the initial phase, uh, there were some grievances regarding um, the, the first MCO. Um, people didn't really understand uh, what some of the provisions uh, uh, were for, but you know, over time, uh, we've actually managed to uh, help the contractors see that the grievance mechanism is something that provides value, and not just um, you know a mechanism to note down grievances. So, um, in a nutshell, uh, human rights due diligence, especially for the supply chain, is something that's here to stay. Um, it, it will probably grow in. Um, sophistication um, and you know there's a great recognition for the complexity of supply chains uh, especially in in sectors such as the energy sector um, collaboration and uh, capability building with contractors is key um, it's not going to happen on its own so uh, you know in order to um, collectively raise the standard of um, human rights in Malaysia for example um, companies do need to work together with their value chain uh, and, and, pro and provide these um, capacity building uh, um, initiatives um, on a regular basis. Um, thirdly, you know, learning from um, our experience from COVID-19 is also key to um, you know, building back better. Uh, we, we did find that um, you know, in a situation like this, um, you know, human rights has suddenly become an optional choice um, between uh, company survival and uh, you know respecting labor rights for example so these are some of the perspectives that need to be um that need to be retooled so uh i'm just going to leave it here charlene uh and happy to take questions later if um if there are any thank you great thank you so much cynthia um i, I think it's really useful to hear um especially from um, the malaysian corporate perspective as well um, I also do see questions. Um, I believe uh, we could probably tackle this um, later in the panel discussion as well. Um, so for now, let's maybe take a quick um, coffee break for about two minutes. And then when we come back later, it will be the panel discussion. As well as if we have time, we're going to be looking through some of these questions and some answering them as well. So see everyone in um, about two minutes. Thank you. All right, everyone. Um, I hope you've grabbed your coffee and um, come, like we're back for our panel discussion. So, um, without much further ado, uh, let's uh, everyone just make yourself comfortable as we begin the panel discussion. But first, let me welcome Miss Anisha Rajapakse, 
the Director of Stakeholder Engagement for the Fair Labor Alliance, who will be serving as the panel moderator for the following session. Really great to have you today um, here with us, um, Anisha. So uh, let me just give a brief introduction. Anisha is a senior global expert with two decades of progressive experience working at the intersection of human rights, business, and international development. To recently, she was Europe-based, working with corporates, governments, international bodies promoting the business and human rights agenda towards ensuring safe jobs in dignified working conditions. Now relocated to Asia, Anisha is the Director of Stakeholder Engagement at the Fair Labor Alliance, supporting companies to ethically recruit and manage workforces and mitigate risk of illegal and unethical exploitation. We're delighted to have her here today to moderate our panel discussion with her insights and expertise to guide the conversation in a meaningful direction. Just also wanted to introduce um, Dr. Radu Maresh from RWI, who's going to be joining our panel discussion today with the rest of the speakers. Um, Dr. Radu is a senior researcher at the Raoul Wallenberg Institute of Human Rights. Um, he specialized in the area of business and human rights with a focus on multinational enterprises and global supply chains. His work combines transnational law, corporate governance, and corporate social responsibility perspectives. Now, I could, I could have all the speakers as well. Um, so Dr. Axel, um, Edmund, and Cynthia, if you could just turn on your videos and get ready for the panel discussion. Um, and I will hand this over to Anisha. We can get started. Thank you, Anisha. Thanks, Charlene, for the introduction. <clears throat> and good afternoon, everyone. Um, Delighted to be here to support BCSC Malaysia and the Raoul Wallenberg Institute for Human Rights and Human Rights Law to moderate this discussion, which is such an important and timely topic. So following on from the excellent and highly informative presentations made in the first half of this webinar, we will now do a bit more of a deep dive to gain further perspectives of trade agreements and the sustainability, human rights and the environmental imperatives contained therein. So as we heard um, from the remarks and the presentations earlier, the thinking that trade agreements should include human rights and environmental concerns has been gathering global momentum in recent years. And over the last couple of years, political shifts, the impact of COVID-19, and the efforts for a shared vision of how to build back better um, have renewed the debate about trade and human rights. Trade agreements have today evolved from uh, being uh, an incentive for trade and transactions between countries through tariffs, quotas, and other, other agreed clauses to including sustainability, human rights, and business. Um, so business has said that over 80%, uh, the Institute of Human Rights and Business has said that over 80% of all trade agreements signed since 2013 include labor provision, and that more than 40% of agreements since 2000 include anti-corruption and anti-bribery clauses. It's also important to note that according to the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, uh, specifically guiding principle number nine, governments must ensure that trade and investment agreements do not constrain the ability to meet their human rights obligations. This is very important to know. And at the same time, other international bodies such as the World Trade Organization, the World Bank and the IMF have increased their influence on the capacity of governments to implement human rights obligations. Also the so-called new generation trade agreements therefore have the potential repercussions for companies given that they demand for more transparency from governments as regards the way that trade policy is formulated and developed. This in turn calls for greater transparency of business practices. As such, the private sector has an important stake in contributing to trade policies which lie at the heart of ensuring the sustainable and inclusive economic growth leading to jobs and wealth creation. However, in order to achieve better economic outcomes resulting from trade and liberalization efforts, businesses cannot and should not be expected to act alone. The systematic considerations of human rights aspects in free trade agreements requires involving all stakeholder groups in preparation, negotiation, and implementation. And some of this was touched on by the previous speakers. And businesses should be a key active stakeholder. Proactive industry associations such as BCSC Malaysia also have a key role to play in encouraging businesses uh, to reference those conventions in their codes of conduct, 
human rights policies and supply chain policies and demonstrate how their practices and policies are aligned with those conventions and declarations of FTAs. So what we must remember is that no longer can local businesses overlook the power of trade investment agreements nationally or regionally as new provisions on human rights, the environment and sustainable development incorporated in FTAs globally will have the impact on their supply chain governance. So now more than ever, the Malaysian business sector needs to join the race to the top towards ensuring responsible supply chain governance. Easing up trade should not result in easing up on human rights and environmental sustainability. So saying that, um, we will begin the panel discussion. And given that our time is limited to 30 minutes, I will now direct two to three questions at our learned panelists. Each will have around one and a half minutes to respond. And thereafter, we will have the panelists address questions directed to them by this audience. And so to maximize the time that we have, I would like to request that the panelists kindly keep your responses brief and targeted. So uh, let me start off with uh, you, Axel. So um, today, the calls to build back better also demands for a renewed focus on ways to effectively align trade policies on the SDGs. But some argue that what is currently in FTAs may not adequately address all the potential human rights issues. So they're calling on getting potential trading partners to conduct detailed and systematic human rights impact assessments before the relevant trading agreements are signed. Um, could you elaborate on what your views would be on this? Thank you very much, Anisha. Yes, that is uh, one of the debates and criticisms I, uh, I mentioned in the uh, presentation. and. The key issue here is that on the one hand, as I said, all human rights are covered under the essential elements chapter. So in principle, they're all covered. But in the trade and sustainable development chapters, there's always a specific um, aspect on labor rights and then specifically on those labor rights, which are included in the ILO declaration of 1998 on fundamental principles and rights at work. Now there is, as you rightly mentioned, a big debate whether that should not be expanded and we might think of other labor and human rights, which should be included more explicitly in the free trade agreement. So that's why we can also monitor uh, the implementation of those and see where the progress is made. We think about conventions on labor inspection, we think about conventions on health and safety and, and these types of issues. And one way to go uh, for that is, as you said, we make a human rights impact assessment and the key priority areas which emerge from that impact assessment could be taken on board in the free trade agreement. Having said that, one of the reasons why they keep the focus on a specific set of conventions across the different free trade agreements is also, of course, to keep a little bit of a level playing field between all the different free trade agreements which the EU has had out there and not create very big differences between the sustainable development chapters in one trade agreement compared to the other. So that's also one of the rationales behind using this blueprint approach. Thank you. Thanks, Axel. So what you're also saying is that actually there is more or less synergy between the various you know, um, trade, um, the requirements uh, in the trade agreements on sustainability and human rights and environmental issues, right? It kind of cuts across, it's the same kind of elements that are prevalent in most of the free trade agreements, right? Yeah, it's a little bit like a blueprint approach. So mm -hmm. remain uh, very similar across the different free trade agreements. But as the ambassador said, there are some specific focus areas with uh, regard to some areas, like now the negotiations with Mercosur obviously have a big part on, on deforestation and forest policy. So there's mm -hmm. a bit of negotiation, but there is a common thread to all free trade agreements. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Axel. Cynthia, moving on to you. Um, so you spoke about a, a bit about this earlier in your in your comments as well. So understanding commitments under trade agreements can help businesses meet their obligations in terms of compliance and be up to speed on how they can actively advocate and know uh, what the avenues are for advocacy and participation during negotiations. 
But in reality, could you kind of uh, let us know whether you feel that businesses in Malaysia are active stakeholders in these processes and are business perspectives given substantial formal representation and inclusion in such negotiations going forward? Thank you, Anisha. Um, interesting question. Um, businesses tend to, to take, especially um, large businesses, tend to take a, a risk-based approach to this question. Um, whether you know FTAs or treaties um, are really top of mind of businesses. To be honest, um, in the value chain, the question is more about um, you know what's the barrier to entry. So um, in terms of um, engagements, it's true. Um, businesses do have uh, the feedback from businesses, uh, their challenges and good practices are something that uh, do need to be taken into account because it does provide a check and balance to whether these um, requirements expressed in, in the treaties um, can actually be implemented. And if so, you know, um, uh, how would they evolve over time? So yes, um, in Malaysia, perhaps um, the thinking, uh, especially from the uh, small and medium industry or enterprise um, level, might not be thinking, you know, too too much about free trade agreements. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, the expression of of those uh, agreements requirements do make their way down to them um, through requirements of their clients. So um, it's it's sort of um, addressed through through that avenue um, rather than a discussion on trade agreements. But yes, the voice of business is really crucial um, to provide um, that feedback uh, on the effectiveness of these requirements in the first place. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. And, and also when you talk about, you know, the SMEs may not be kind of mainstreamed into the discussions at the moment. Increasingly, it is important because with the forthcoming mandatory human rights due diligence of the EU, um, it goes beyond the first tier suppliers. So uh, it's very important to really um, be transparent and kind of really assess and know your supply chain, right? And so this includes many of the SMEs. That's absolutely right. Um, in fact, this is one of the discussions that's, um, uh, the, the shape of the discussion, the shape of the discussion that's taking place in the industry because the energy sector is now includes, including um, renewable and the renewable energy space. Um, so uh, you do find that there's a, a broader spectrum of suppliers and different kinds of conversations that we need to have. And that recognition of um, the value chain impact is something that um, the industry is really uh, working on. Great, thank you. Thank you for that. <clears throat> Radu, over to you, Radu. So, um, if some trade flows undermine and weaken progress on human rights and environmental goals, um, what would your perspective be in terms of the steps Malaysian companies could take to make changes? Thank you, Anisha. Glad to be here. I think the answers were uh, roughly provided by Edmund and Cynthia in their presentations. Those were concrete steps. Um, the answer in one sentence is human rights due diligence. This is the general expectation that we hear from international organizations, from the EU, from national governments. Companies have to respect human rights and the practical way to do it is by uh, conducting human rights due diligence. And um, uh, participants have already explained and covered different aspects. If I could give just a few pointers to simplify to the maximum would be, of course, due diligence. It's not only what happens in your own factory, but what happens in the supplier factories, as well as in the distributors' uh, operations. So due diligence covers the entire supply chain. Uh, due diligence, basically, it's about two things. It's about understanding your impacts, the risks that your operations pose. The second is to take action to eliminate, to minimize uh, those impacts. And this is a classical risk management approach uh, dealing with other financial and business risks. It's risk management lead, leading to continuous uh, improvement uh, in performance and progressive elimination of human rights abuses in the entire supply chain. In terms of the concrete steps, uh, what can be done? I think there are two sets of actions here. So after you identify your impacts, 
uh, you understand them, you analyze them, you rank them, then it's time to take action. And then action needs to be taken internally within the company, but also looking externally, outwardly. And internally, it's all about improving uh, codes, policies, systems, procedures, so the company is better prepared to, to handle human rights risks. Uh, looking externally, things become, of course, more complex, and the, there are issues of uh, supply chain management here. And one very important thing to, to, to emphasize is that companies, through their own decisions, their own conduct, can create problems and uh, human rights harms deep in the supply chain. The way that uh, large companies place their orders, they're responsible for that and the effects are rippling throughout the supply chain in supplier factories. Um, so that's one thing to watch over, you know, how your own conduct is impacting the supply chain. The other thing is how you relate to suppliers, to distributors that are infringing human rights. And this is the issue of leverage, how you influence them. And here I would only point to ideas of shared responsibility because quite often issues like uh, uh, living wages or child labor are quite systemic, they have very deep roots and to really tackle at scale this type of, of issues, you need the ideas of shared responsibility, collective action, working with different uh, actors. So I would, I would stop here and uh, follow the discussion further on. Thank you, Radu. No, it's very true in terms of collective action, shared responsibility. And again, it's to emphasize that businesses can't tackle this on their own. So there has to be more of a multi-stakeholder approach going forward. So um, this, you know, your your comments also kind of tie in with one of the questions that's already out, and I will include this as well to this. Is um, do you feel that Malaysian business and entities are really ready for human rights due diligence and supply chain audits? And uh, what is the downside uh, in FTA in an FTA of non-compliance if these are provisions included uh, in an FTA? Just briefly, because we, yeah, Edmund will also, um, you know, speak about this a little bit in his uh, uh, question. Uh, Anisha, is the question for me? Yes, yes, please, Radu. Okay. Well, I mean, if if you ask me if Swedish companies are ready, I wouldn't know what to <laughs> answer. I would say that some are, some are not, but I think they can get ready much faster than ten years ago. I think we have a clarity of what is expected from them. There are lots of tools. And if they are not ready, I would say it would be advisable to, to be ready because uh, the issue is becoming one of legal compliance. Due diligence is becoming mandatory. We heard mm -hmm. about the laws. So uh, uh, there is no, no option. It's just a, 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 a question about is it wiser for a company to, to comply preventively, to be prepared and uh, be ahead of the competitors or would they like to, to wait and see and risk sanctions and the action from the investors, from consumers? Um, so that I think it's a strategic business decision, but I think uh, the tools are out there, the clarity is uh, uh, enhancing. And I would say uh, that uh, trade agreements and human rights due diligence are two sides of the same coin. Because mm -hmm. free trade agreements are agreements between states about uh, conducting trade with values with respect for labor rights. Due diligence speaks directly to the company. It's a responsibility, perhaps a legal obligation soon. So that's what companies have to do to do business while respecting human rights and protecting the environment. Thank you, Radu. So yeah, that, that's very true. And, and basically what you're also, I'm assuming you're saying is also that we need to be more responsive than reactive, right? Because now the, um, the legal landscape is closing in, really. So, you know, it's, it's critical that you are responsive rather than just uh, when something blows up and you start scrabbling to see what can be done, right? Right. Edmund, moving on to you, and uh, it's good to see you. We're, we're happy to have you um, on the panel. Um, so could you um, kind of say a little bit about um, what sanctions could mean for businesses in Malaysia and maybe give an example um, from learning uh, from country level experience perhaps? In terms of uh, violations of... Yeah, kind of non-compliance, you know, like what would it mean, you know? Yeah, 
I, I think that's a, that's a very broad question. If we yeah. look at it in terms of the environment, the laws that Malaysia has uh, compared to labor is, I would say, less. Uh, the quality as well uh, it, it is not uh, on par with what I think is required. So in terms of labor, we, we have good laws. We, of course, always have room to improve. Implementation is really poor. Um, and I think there is the problem of overlapping jurisdictions among ministries regarding labor issues in Malaysia. I think that's really clear. And some ministries and agencies would not want to let go their jurisdiction. So that clarity we have been pushing for Malaysian government to, to decide on. Um, Ministry of Human Resource on one hand, uh, Home Affairs on the other, Sometimes labor issues are seen as security issues as opposed to pure labor issue, uh, labor management issues. I think that that's one real big problem. In terms of the environment, the Environmental Quality Act and um, the, the regulations, we have, I think, the basic expected standards. But in terms of whether it meets the higher global standards, I think there is much room for improvement. The question as to whether companies are going to be able to uh, comply and, and, and what sanctions are there, there, I think there's a good question in a box which I saw and that, that we should make a distinction in Malaysia between companies, that, multinational companies, larger companies and SMEs. The ones which are public listed have uh, huge teams, uh, quality auditors, outsourced um, specialists who are able to help with the audits, who are able to help with the scope of work. Uh, Malaysia, I think, should uh, pay some more focus and civil society should pay some more focus on the SMEs because in terms of the expertise, in terms of the resources and capacities to be able to meet some of these obligations like human rights due diligence and supply chain audits, it'd be much more difficult. And whether the tools that are available to these SMEs are uh, currently sufficient uh, is another question. Uh, over to you, Anisha. Thank you, Edmund. And what you're saying is very true because in discussions I've had with uh, SMEs, you know, when it comes to business and human rights training and human rights due diligence, what I often hear is, but you know, Anisha, what, like, what can we do? We don't have big budgets. We don't have big CSR teams. We are like small groups. So what, what is it that we can do? Um, so they kind of feel that it's a kind of a dead end for them, that they're be between a rock and a hard place. But what I kind of believe is the fact that, you know, they cannot take that stance because they are part of the broader supply chain, you know, so uh, it, it's in their interest to do something. But, I'm, but I completely take your point, the fact that there needs to be more uh, SME-centered kind of tools that would be useful for them so that they can uh, comply, they can, you know, at least address like the low-hanging fruit, right, going forward. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think the, the focus on SMEs, the simplification of the tools, the standards need not change, but the simplification mm -hmm. of the tools uh, are, are really required. And I think that's the real gap in the market at the moment. Definitely. Thank you for that, Edmund. So um, there's another question that I'm going to actually put to all the panelists and um, you know, whoever wishes to uh, respond to it, please go ahead. So um, today, as you know, many trade agreements take human rights impact into consideration, but the monitoring systems that have emerged up to now are not seen to be very comprehensive. So without robust human rights monitoring, the trading partners have little chance of making sure that their counterparts are meeting their commitments. Um, so what I would like to hear from you is like, how do human rights monitoring processes contribute towards ensuring better risk management going forward? Can I go first? Yes, Axel, please. Um, thank you very much, Anisha. I think monitoring is crucial if you want to follow up how these provisions are implemented. That's one part. And also it's linked to uh, an issue which you also already mentioned in the previous question, which is popping up in the Q&A, 
is how it can contribute to fostering compliance. And here it needs to feed into, let's say, a whole chain of what we would say implementation where you make commitments, have enough uh, elements in place to monitor whether the commitments are made. And then the question is, what might happen in case of, of non-compliance? And, and the monitoring shows that uh, uh, there is not sufficient, let's say, uh, compliance. So in that chain, monitoring is crucial. And a, a lot of been, debates have been held on that on the EU approach. And I think the monitoring in the EU will uh, depend on once using monitoring instruments of international organizations. So more engaging with ILO, more engaging with uh, international conventions on environment and so on. Second, further integrating stakeholders in the monitoring process. And for that, there needs to be capacity, there needs to be resources, there needs to be training. And uh, there's a bit of a debate on who should bear the responsibility there. And I think mm -hmm. one of the elements there is that the EU might provide more technical and capacity building uh, resources to enable that. And then, of course, uh, once we have that, we, we need to see how that feeds into compliance. And here, as we uh, know that in free trade agreements, there's not a very strong compliance instrument. It's not like in the US trade agreements where you have fines, where you have maybe have suspensions. And that relates to the whole debate on whether we should include sanctions in free trade agreements or not to foster compliance. But there's actually quite a difficult debate because we don't have much evidence that strong sanctions and compliance mechanisms really contribute to better human rights protection. So that would be my, my approach to this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Axel. And this kind of leads in also to another question that uh, has come up um, in terms of the fact that you, know, you talked about, you know, you, you know, to fulfill the obligations that generally funds are given. And so, um, you know, developed uh, trade partners like the US and the EU uh, do provide uh, developing country governments, you know, on capacity building and so on. So um, how would you feel uh, that businesses can avail Malaysia, for, you know, for example, in case in point, can avail uh, of such allocated support? And any one of the panelists, please uh, feel free to respond. Uh, perhaps I can chip in on that. I, yeah, I, after, after spending about three years uh, with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and seeing how dialogue partners and the capacity that uh, the, the available opportunities of potential and capacity with uh, larger dialogue partners, the European Union, Americans, Swedish. Uh, there is actually a lot of opportunities for our private sector and businesses to up their game and build their capacities. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities because there are many technical arrangements, technical support programs. The, and that's why I, I post in my, my paper, uh, the real problem I think is, is that there is a bureaucracy uh, uh, gap or block uh, sometimes at the ministries and agencies on how to get these things going on scale, on scale level. One, I think sometimes there is a huge fear, uh, and especially in ASEAN with a lot of different countries, not just Malaysia, there's a huge fear that uh, so a lot of these human rights dialogue programs or technical support programs uh, uh, for a certain reason or for a certain agenda. And that always, always comes up and it takes a lot of time for Malaysian and other countries in ASEAN to actually get socialized towards that. Uh, I, I think that that's very important. The second point is that while there is that kind of support, whether but through funding or technical support, there is a fear that uh, there is a, it becomes a proliferation uh, of, of time and resources on already very stretched resource, uh, already very stretched uh, agencies uh, locally. So if you imagine that even Malaysia, we, we, I know for a fact that a lot of the agencies are very stretched in terms of time and resources. Imagine a country like Laos uh, or even a country like um, uh, a smaller country than us. So in terms of how do we uh, make sure that there's no overlap? How do we make sure that the programs are effective, that it's not just being done for the sake of being done uh, is, the, is the real challenge. And I think the... Uh, the, the, then the next question, the next layer is to what extent do these trickle down to businesses and civil society? A lot of these programs are done at a very high elite level uh, and we, we see that they do not trickle down enough 
because people on the table usually are either senior officials from the ministry or from local agencies and, and there's no, not enough involvement uh, with the businesses. I think the businesses in Malaysia are only starting to slowly get used to this idea of business and human rights because Malaysia has sort of domesticated this idea that, that we need a national action plan on business and human rights. Thank you, Edmund. That's very true. And also, like, I think it's not just limited to Malaysia because basically what's needed in a lot of developing countries in the region is like there has to be more of a harmonized response between uh, the re relevant of, or the different government ministries because everything is like very ad hoc. And as you say, like the awareness levels on these things is also ad hoc. And, you know, it's kind of, yeah, it, it, there's, there's like it's a lot of it is also kind of top down because it also comes from international organizations, but how it's kind of translated and as you say, trickle down to the businesses of, or businesses of different levels, because as you know, like the big players already, you know, know most of the most of these things are kind of in their DNA because they've had to, you know, they built up their reputation based on that. But it's the smaller ones and not the usual suspects who need a lot of the help right going forward. Yes, can I uh, pick yes, in just for the small point also related to what, what Radu said is that um, with specifically with regard to human rights due diligence uh, uh, legislation and regulation, uh, it, it's important to understand that there's a real, let's say, development in that respect, especially also in, in, in Europe. The Commission will make a proposal, that's one, but there are already some countries which have very far going uh, legislations in place. The Dutch have the uh, uh, regulation on preventing child labor. The French have a, a duty of diligence law uh, and these types of things. And the common thread is they all put due diligence requirements on, 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 on companies. And that really goes down uh, the value chain. And these due diligence requirements uh, can have very severe and quick consequences. To give you one example, in, uh, in the late 1990s, early 2000s, when there were food crises in Europe, uh, the UK developed a, a law which put due diligence requirements on food retailers. And that actually meant that throughout their value chain, uh, they had to put systems in place to check quality, safety, and, and things of food. And these due diligence systems spilled completely over to the producers. And there were some countries uh, uh, and some producers in some countries which could not comply with the due diligence requirement. And one of these requirements was, for example, to get certification by a certain certification body. And they lost their export markets basically overnight. And they lost a lot of revenues just because they were no longer able to access value chains. And one should not underestimate the potential impact of these due diligence requirements on a lot of players around the world. And that brings me to the final point in the sense that this is, of course, important for businesses to be aware of. But as you rightly pointed out, it also is a government responsibility to really start thinking about how can we prepare our businesses, how can we prepare our entrepreneurs to these challenges. And we think about training, we think about capacity building, we might even think about certain subsidy programs to really get people up to speed in order to not only remain in value chains, but also maybe to expand uh, their potential export. And from that perspective, the developments which are ongoing here might spill over quite quickly to a lot of um, uh, producers in, in Asian countries. Thank you, Axel. That's very Thank true. And Radu, yeah, Radu, go yeah, ahead. If, if, if I could add, because I think that there were two points I wanted to stress here. Mm -hmm. What Axel said that actually it's possible to narrow down and prioritize and break down this huge complexity and the issue of trickling down i think it's also very very important i mean i i can totally understand the smaller business uh, perhaps even bigger ones that struggle to understand what is this whole thing about business and human rights and due diligence it's a new topic it's huge it covers all industries all human rights so it's it's a lot of content there so it can be overwhelming in the same time talking about capacity building um there, are, there is lots of training available there, whether it comes from a business associations like the business council or perhaps from the, from the buyers for the big brands that are very keen to train their suppliers. 
Uh, also, the policymakers, governments, the European Commission are very eager to issue guidance, even create exemptions from compliance for very small companies and so on. Um, I would say that, that small SMEs, uh, parts of uh, uh, global supply chains, already deal, for example, rules of origin, right? So very technical issues about their role in the global supply chains. Those, I would say, are even more complex than some aspects of complying with human rights. So I think one of the gains of the human rights due diligence approach is that it really allows you to break down complexity and actually prioritize, prioritize the impacts, the actions that need to be taken. And once they are broken down uh, in dozens of parts, then I think they become much easier to, to, to manage. Very true. Thank you very much, Radu. Really interesting. And um, Cynthia, there's um, there's a question that's come to you as well um, from the audience. So um, as a leading Malaysian company, what kind of assistance do you think you would need in order to be able to better implement human rights and environmental clauses in trade agreements going forward? Um, has Petronas moved on any of these requirements? Thank you for that question. Um, I, I would say that um, you know, uh, maybe picking up from the points that um, Dr. Radu just made, um, it's not really the assistance that a, a company like Petronas would need, but it's probably, um, you know, kind of a, a systemic value chain approach from how, for how to trickle these trade agreements requirements down to the grassroots level at the SAB level. So um, perhaps, you know, some support for companies that do in fact um, uh, train their value chain um, would certainly be helpful because um, what companies like ours do um, is we break down the requirements into actionable steps. I think SMEs just need actionable steps. So for example, what we do for grievance mechanism is to say, have a grievance mechanism. This is the minimum of what it needs to look like. And um, you'll be surprised that um, it's, it's not as um, well understood as, you know, the, the term grievance mechanism is not as well understood as we think it is. So, um, you know, what companies tend to do in their trainings um, is really to break it down into, you know, some priority areas that need to be addressed. Um, but to roll that up, you know, into ultimately um, complying with uh, requirements that are in, in agreements is something which is, um, you know, which, which needs to be thought through, you know, from, from a systemic level. So maybe there is uh, a break between uh, what could be offered uh, by um, say the EU or um, you know, relevant ministries in terms of trainings, uh, but companies themselves have taken you know, the initiative to do that you know, based on the, the risks that they face. Um, the last point I would just like to make is that um, for, for the energy sector, the issue is quite interesting because um, where we find elevated risks of um, labor of uh, labor and, and other human rights, you know, potential, um, uh, pot potential issues is really uh, more in the um, uh, subcontractor level and beyond. So our initial, our immediate contractors um, would probably not be, you know, the, the risk of it would probably be relatively low. This is for the energy sector. So um, it's slightly different from agriculture or maybe um, other industries where you know, it, it's, it's relatively visible um, how that might look like. So um, that there, in terms of capacity building and training, that, there are several layers that in fact that need to be addressed in a more um, consistent level. It's really the contractors themselves and then, you know, to um, enable them or, or to at least provide some tools for them to train their own value chain. So uh, it, tends to, to, it tends to have that multiplier effect. Um, in, in, in the ideal world, um, everybody would have the same sort of um, understanding after going through you know, a couple of rounds of trainings, but we know that that's not really something that happens. So it's more consistently um, um, you know, ensuring that this approach is there and perhaps um, you know, recognizing that, that there is a, a grassroots level here you know, that, that tends to um, um, ha have an impact on, on fulfilling the trade agreements, but you know, they're not necessarily talking about trade agreements when, when they're thinking about human rights. <clears throat> yes, thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. And, and as you say also, I mean, there isn't, I mean, to reach the, the supply chain, you know, down, down the line, um, kind of having a template training does not work, you know, because it, it, it varies from 
sector to sector, but at the same time, it's more about the awareness, right? In terms of what are the uh, salient risks as you know, as we know it, like how does it apply, right? So that is quite critical. And um, just just um, want to also find out, like what 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 are your thoughts on this? The fact, like, do suppliers and contractors view human rights as a challenge or an opportunity to winning contracts? Um, well, during this COVID period, it's more of a more of a hurdle. Um, uh, but but then again, you know, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, um, some some practices of non-compliance have been normalized. Um, so uh, when when Malaysia, for example, revised its minimum standards on um, worker um, housing and amenities, um, the the issue of uh, which 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 is a requirement that that the EU has had for a while, you know, uh, in terms of um, personal space, the four meter square personal space that you need to have, is all of a sudden you know um, something of an issue. Um, so uh, there there are those uh, really uh, granular level types of issues that um, uh, that contractors do face, and um, it's more you know going back to the earlier points you know raised uh, by the panel as well. It's more work uh, an issue. Uh, I think the a more effective approach is working with rather than saying you need to meet the four meter square um, requirement because in order for it to be sustainable, um, businesses of various sizes um, need to understand that, um, you know, this is actually for the benefit, uh, for, for a long-term sustainable benefit. Exactly, thank you, Cynthia. And there's like one, um, because we are running out of time, so there's one um, last question actually. So um, as, as I mean, if you know, there are other human rights and sustainability monitoring mechanisms that the EU has, such as the GSP plus schemes. And just, you know, from a personal standpoint, for example, at the moment, the EU Commission is considering a temporary withdrawal of GSP plus trade concessions to Sri Lanka. The GSP plus scheme is conditional on Sri Lanka advancing human and labor rights and working towards sustainable development. And GSP plus is currently being used as a leverage uh, by highlighting the need for advancement on the country's human rights obligations. And any such withdrawal, as you can imagine, would be hugely challenging prospects for industries that are direct beneficiaries of the GSP plus concessions and uh, will undoubtedly lead to job losses, affect the country's competitiveness in global markets and impact on foreign exchange earnings. So what do you think are the lessons that can be drawn upon these to improve human rights monitoring of future trade agreements and schemes for Malaysia? Uh, yes, Axel. On the GS, it's a very good question, Anisha, and it's also a very sensitive question in, in the sense that the EU has not much leverage in terms of addressing non-compliance, except for using very strong uh, non-compliance sanctions, and that's the withdrawal of preferences. And as you rightly uh, mentioned, that will hurt uh, not only the government, but also many businesses and many people working in, in businesses. And whether that types of sanctions is working or not is actually current quite a bit of a debate on, because sometimes if we see that withdrawing these preferences uh, does not always lead to better human rights protection afterwards. So I think one should be careful in considering what would be appropriate sanctions uh, in case of, of, of compliance. And so if we want to link the debate of the GSP to the debate on the, on the FTA, it's for me not a straightforward uh, let's say, case to apply the sanction mechanism, which is embedded in the GSP to the, to the FDAs. I think we would need more refined, more targeted uh, sanctioning regime if we really want to think about an enforcement mechanism and a sanctioning regime coupled to non-compliance of human rights protection. Yes. Thank you, Axel. And yes, definitely like, you know, whether in actuality the carrot and stick approach would work or not remains to be seen. And there are other ways of trying to achieve the necessary results, right? Right. So, um, Anisha, um, yes, Radu, if please. To add just, uh, just one uh, of two sentences here. We heard from His Excellency, the EU ambassador, that two days ago, the European Commission proposed uh, um, 
an updated, a reviewed version of the GSP kicking in in beginning of 2024 for the next 10 years afterwards. And the, one of the changes, one of the improvements is uh, especially this idea of uh, having a special assessment of the economic social impacts of the withdrawal. So it's not done hastily and uh, uh, with unintended effects. And during the consultation process, the commission ran a very interesting idea was to create an exemption from a withdrawal in the withdrawal context for operators that do due diligence. So individual companies that really make an effort to comply, how would they be hit by this withdrawal and whether an exception should be created for them so they can continue to be part of the global supply chains. Unfortunately, as far as I could see, reading quickly through the commission draft, um, this proposal was not taken up. Right, that's very interesting, and um, and and it, and it's true. I mean, you know, it's 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 a challenging way of going about it, really. But um, but it's good that the that the situation is tightening. But at the same time, it has to work for businesses as well. And uh, with the mandatory human rights due diligence coming into play, it's also to ensure that businesses are translating their human rights policies into tangible actions, really, because very often it sits with papers and reports and annual reports and so on, and the declarations are there, but how are they actually working on the ground? How is it being implemented? And I guess greater scrutiny of that going forward, even with GSP Plus probably would definitely help, right? Great, so I think we're like kind of coming to the end of our panel session, but since I've already been speaking with you all on this, I think it might be better if I give um, the floor to each of you in terms of like a couple of last comments that you would like to share with the audience before we wind up and I hand it over to Charlene. Cynthia, would you like to start? Sure, thank you. Um, the one comment I would like to make is that, um, you know, working together with contractors and suppliers is really the key to ensuring um, human rights is respected. Um, and understanding, you know, their challenges uh, would definitely enable, um, you know, companies and perhaps uh, governments later uh, to, um, you know, have uh, policies and processes that, that actually work on the ground. So that's my comment. Thank you, Cynthia. Edmund, would you like to go next? Yeah, thank you. I just want to add that one form of pressure uh, is public pressure. Uh, today, companies, businesses cannot run away from the fact that the new media, social media is extremely powerful. And of course, there, there are a lot of unwarranted comments that are made about businesses and how they are treated. But there are also a lot of information that goes around that are genuine and legitimate. And businesses cannot run and hide from a lot of these genuine complaints. Uh, and, and it's better to deal with these things um, because uh, that would, they, they will really just affect your business. I, I've just uh, presented how in terms of the environment, the government ought to have a public feedback mechanism and that would allow civil society organizations to have more access to information that would allow civil society organizations and the public to complain about how the government treats the environment. And I think that's a, a good, a new way to go in terms of uh, pressure, in terms of getting things to change. Thank you. Thanks, Edmund. So yeah, very true in terms of like the fact that, you know, in this brave new world, we are in a, we're living in an era of hyper-transparency. So there is very little room to escape. So there is greater scrutiny and, whether you talk about like uh, you know fishermen out in the waters or whatever, everybody has a smartphone, you know, nowadays. So it is very easy. So it's better to be prepared for the consequences of all that. Um, Radu, Axel, which one of you would like to speak next? Uh, Anisha, I actually prepared for the one minute last pitch, but you just <laughs> said at the end, be prepared. Sorry. And the message we, we are giving, especially also maybe from a European perspective is that there are many different developments, whether we talk about GSP, free trade agreements, human rights, due diligence, other types of regulations, they all affect global value chains. And if you as a company want to be part of global value chains, you really need to think about it, 
and reflect on how you can uh, manage your company accordingly. And that will mean that being prepared is the key issue or the key message maybe take away. Excellent. Thank you very much, Axel. Radu, would you like to? Yes, I would imitate uh, Axel in this <laughs> respect, and I would say be informed. Um, the thing is that the European Commission has uh, commissioned actually a very large study, comparative empirical study on free trade agreements, uh, US, EU, and many other countries, just to understand empirically, but also based on a vast literature, uh, what is the design of free trade agreements, what's the institutional mechanism, and what are their effects, the impacts in practice. And this, I think, is going to be very important work, very interesting, one of the largest studies, and it should be out by the end of the year, so in the coming months. I look forward to reading that. Thank you. Yes, um, so do I. So. Um, with that, um, thank you so much, each of you. I think this is a really interesting uh, you know, conversation and I think we could have gone on for a lot longer, but time constraints uh, prevent us from doing that at the moment. But thanks very much for all of your input. Um, I found it very stimulating as well to be moderating this session. And um, I will now hand it over to Charlene to um, close this um, webinar. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Anisha. I also see that our executive um, director, Mr. Roberto Benicello, is uh, with us as well. Um, Roberto, do you, do you have a few words to share? Um, otherwise, I'll move to the closing. Yeah. No, thank you, Shirley. It was a very, very interesting uh, discussion. I follow that uh, with uh, yeah, a lot of interest. So yeah, over to you for the closing. Right, thank you. Um, just wanted to thank everyone, all of our speakers and panelists for your engagement in this very exciting discussion. Thank you so much to Anisha as well for leading this um, in, in um, a great direction. Um, I think just wanted to pick up on a point that you made about, um, um, like um, Anisha, you mentioned about making tangible, you know, changes or concrete approaches, um, which I think is uh, also really key um, in understanding um, how businesses, you know, can align themselves um, in the area of human rights and environmental concerns. Um, and um, I think this has been a really informative discussion. Um, thank you all for being here for this productive session. Um, but there are some questions I noticed that we didn't manage to tackle. Um, sorry about that in the interest of time. Um, however, I would also like to point out that we have further sessions planned. Um, for example, there was a question on blockchain solution, um, topics like digitalization and technology, how this is going to be um, helpful um, to help businesses align themselves with human rights concerns. Um, these are all topics that we'll be interested in exploring um, for some of our future um, events. As mentioned, BCSD Malaysia is partnering with the Rao Wonderbook Institute um, of Human Rights and Humanitarian Law on this Business for Human Rights and the Environment in Malaysia platform. Today's webinar is again part of this initiative. Um, this platform is going to be focusing on reinforcing large companies' knowledge of the international, regional, and national law and policy frameworks in Malaysia, Southeast Asia, and internationally. This will enable companies to identify and effectively describe risks and tensions in realizing human rights in environmental protection and climate change contexts, as well as to rethink and adopt, um, again, tangible or, or concrete new strategies and approaches as highlighted by our many speakers today, um, to better embed the right to a healthy environment into their respective mandates. If you're interested in learning more about this platform, please, um, you could let us know uh, via the chat box. Um, otherwise, uh, kindly follow us uh, on our social media. Um, stay in touch. Uh, we'll be getting in touch with you soon as well. And stay home, stay safe, and we'll see you again for the next section. Thank you for your time. <laughs>